After eight years as president, I have only two regrets. That I have not shot Henry Clay or hanged John C. Calhoun. Andrew Jackson. Oh, hi. Mr. Lahasky here. And today, we return our attention to national politics in the first half of the 19th century. The decade following the War of 1812, also known as the Era of Good Feelings, was a time of unprecedented political stability in the United States. The demise of the Federalist Party left the nation's government in the hands of Democratic Republicans, who diversified their platform to appeal to Americans in all regions. However, as sectionalism began to rear its head in the early 1820s, the Democratic Republican Party began to fracture. This, in combination with an expansion of democracy that began in the West, led to the Jacksonian Age, that period including and surrounding the presidency of Andrew Jackson. Jackson gained national notoriety during the War of 1812 after his defense of New Orleans, and his successes in the military served to springboard him into national politics. Today, we'll discuss Jackson's presidency, as well as the developments that made it possible. But first, a big question. How should we remember Andrew Jackson? During the 1820s and 1830s, Andrew Jackson may have been the most polarizing figure in the United States, and to this day he remains highly controversial. Jackson was hugely popular among the common farmer in the West and the South, but his rise to the White House on a platform of anti-establishment and anti-elitist ideas alarmed many in Washington, who saw Jackson as a threat to American democracy. Many political scientists and historians have drawn comparisons between Jackson's rise and that of Donald Trump in 2016. Both were outsiders to national politics. Both endured heavy criticism from career politicians, and both caused major disruptions within the political parties. Jackson's legacy is even more complicated. He advanced the cause of the common man, worked to limit excessive government spending, and took decisive action that may have prevented civil war. But Jackson's racist inclinations and consequential economic policy have many people today questioning his veneration in monuments and on currency. Indeed, Andrew Jackson turned traditional American politics on its ear in the 1820s, and he did so in the name of common man democracy. But did his actions as president truly advance the power of the people, or were the fears of his political opponents justified? Let's take a look, then you decide. Our first big idea sets the stage for the so-called Age of Jackson. Expansions in democracy in the early 1800s, particularly the establishment of universal white male suffrage, created conditions that favored the rise of the likes of Andrew Jackson. Now, when we talk about democracy expanding, what we're really talking about is giving the people more political power. The most obvious way to expand democracy is by extending voting rights to new groups. This became a trend in the early 1800s, and it allowed for unconventional politicians like Andrew Jackson to grow competitive in elections. To understand this development, we need to turn our focus to the American West. You'll remember that ever since independence, Americans have been sprawling to the West. Indeed, westward migration was a constant theme of the 1800s. Most Western migrants were farmers of lower socioeconomic classes in search of cheap land and economic opportunity. Many of these poor farmers had been disenfranchised in the East since voting rights were limited to property-holding men of the upper classes. It makes sense, then, that when Westerners established their own democratic institutions, they sought to eliminate voting restrictions that had once excluded them. Universal white male suffrage began in western states like Indiana and Missouri, and eventually caught on in the east as well. And thanks to the establishment of universal white male suffrage, the expanded electorate of the 1820s consisted of far more lower and middle class Americans. Many were small farmers or factory workers. They were generally less educated, more rugged, and more individualistic than the elite class that had once monopolized political power. This new electorate opened the door for unconventional politicians who appealed to the tough mindset of the common man. Foremost among them was Andrew Jackson. 
Jackson, a Tennessean, was himself a Westerner who embodied many of the characteristics of this expanding electorate. He was self-made, independent-minded, and featured a short temper and a reputation for dueling. After a successful military career won him national notoriety, Jackson made a run for president in 1824. The adult election of 1824 and its results are outlined in our second big idea. The deep rift between Andrew Jackson and the antebellum political establishment caused chaos in the election of 1824, which ended the era of good feelings and gave rise to the second party system. As a candidate for president, Jackson ran on an anti-elitist, anti-intellectual, and anti-establishment platform. His messaging and persona resonated with the newly expanded electorate, and Jackson did well at the polls, receiving more votes for president than any other candidate. But the election of 1824 was sticky for a couple of reasons. Remember, during the era of good feelings, the Democratic-Republican Party moved towards the center of the political spectrum embracing former Federalist policies like the National Bank, the tariff, and government-funded internal improvements. But sectional differences began to fracture the unity of the Democratic Republicans in the early 1820s. And by 1824, the party was without a clear direction. As a result, four Democratic Republicans ran for president in 1824. John Quincy Adams from Massachusetts, Andrew Jackson from Tennessee, William Crawford of Georgia, and Henry Clay of Kentucky. While Jackson led all candidates in the popular vote and the Electoral College, the crowded field prevented him from receiving an electoral majority. Now, per the Constitution, if no candidate receives an Electoral College majority, the election is decided in the House of Representatives. And this is where things get stickier still. The Kentuckian Henry Clay had come in last place in the popular vote and the electoral vote. He recognized his chances for the presidency were slim, but Clay hated Andrew Jackson. At the time, Clay was also the Speaker of the House of Representatives, with many allies in that chamber. So he encouraged his friends in the House to leverage their votes to John Quincy Adams in order to block Jackson's candidacy, and they did. John Quincy Adams was elected president in the House, and Jackson was furious. Jackson argued that the House had ignored the will of the American people and undermined democracy, and he blamed Henry Clay. His suspicion of Clay was augmented when Quincy Adams named Clay his Secretary of State, the most coveted position in the presidential cabinet. Jackson declared that a corrupt bargain had taken place between John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay and that the election had been stolen from him. He immediately began his campaign for the next presidential election, launching a four-year political assault on Clay and Adams. If there had been any doubt, the election of 1824 made clear that the era of good feelings had ended. The Democratic-Republican Party split in two, giving rise to the second American party system. The new parties coalesced around Jackson and Clay. Jackson's followers called themselves the Democrats, and they traced their ideological lineage to Thomas Jefferson. Jacksonian Democrats valued the liberty of the individual and trusted the common man to rule. They were the anti-establishment party and distrusted bankers, merchants, speculators, and many politicians. They opposed tariffs and the National Bank. They championed states' rights and opposed government spending for internal improvements. The Jacksonians also favored the removal of Native Americans from established U.S. states, an increasingly contentious issue in the 1800s. Opposing the Democrats was the newly formed Whig Party. This party was led by Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams, and originated as the Anti-Jackson Party. The Whigs placed value in the community. They believed that strong central government was critical in order to coordinate the expanding American economy. They favored tariffs to protect American manufacturing and supported the National Bank. Finally, they lobbied for government spending on infrastructure and internal improvements. They preferred a comprehensive approach to promote economic growth known as the American system. The Democratic and Whig parties emerged out of the feud between Jackson and Clay, but the organizations endured to oppose one another for the next 30 years.
four years after the controversial 1824 election, Andrew Jackson claimed his vengeance and won the presidential election of 1828. Thanks to recent expansions in democracy, Jackson was able to reconstruct the Jeffersonian coalition of the early 1800s. He rode to the White House on the backs of northern farmers and artisans, southern states' rights advocates, slaveholders and wealthy planters, and western agriculturalists. To the chagrin of Henry Clay and many establishment politicians in Washington, Jackson took the oath of office in March 1829. Jackson's two terms as president were busy and, at times, controversial. The course of his presidency is outlined in our third big idea. Jackson's record as president was mixed. His policies generally advanced the cause of the common man, but were detrimental to ethnic minorities and sometimes undermined democratic institutions. Jackson was, without a doubt, a strong leader who was wildly popular among the so-called common man, which in this context refers to white farmers and laborers of the lower and middle economic classes. One way he attempted to serve this common man was through the controversial policy of Indian removal. In 1832, Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, which forced Native Americans of the Cherokee Nation off of their ancestral land in the Carolinas and Georgia. Jackson also supported state laws that displaced members of the Seminole, Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw tribes. In the same year, members of the Cherokee Nation challenged the legality of Indian removal. And in the case of Worcester v. Georgia, the Supreme Court actually ruled in the Cherokees' favor. But Jackson refused to enforce the court's decision, and the government proceeded with the eviction. While Indian removal freed up new land for white farmers, its effects were devastating for the tribes. Enforcing Jackson's Indian removal law in 1838, the United States Army orchestrated a forced march of over 15,000 Cherokees from Georgia to present-day Oklahoma. Over 4,000 of them, nearly a third, did not survive the Trail of Tears. Those who did were faced with a harsh new reality in the West. The arid climate of the so-called Indian Territory was not conducive to the agricultural traditions of Cherokee life, leading to widespread poverty. It took the Cherokees years to adapt to their new environment and for their society to recover. In some ways, it never did. Another example of Jackson's governance for the so-called common man can be found in his veto of the National Bank. In 1832, Henry Clay persuaded Congress to renew the bank's charter for another 20 years, but Jackson utilized the power of the veto to cancel that action and end the National Bank for good. So with his veto, Jackson was able to claim to the common man he was taking charge in order to root out corruption. But Jackson's critics pointed out that his expansion of the power of the presidency through the veto undermined democracy and bordered on despotism. You see, the National Bank wasn't Jackson's only veto. In all, Jackson vetoed 12 bills, more than all of his predecessors combined. Jackson's opponents saw this as an erosion of American democracy, since each of the laws in question had been passed by Congress. Whig Party members charged that Jackson was denying the will of the people by vetoing legislation they had approved. Then, in what was perhaps the most important development of Jackson's presidency, he even engendered criticism from his own party by asserting the power of the federal government and denying states' rights. This is our final big idea. Andrew Jackson clashed with his own party during the nullification crisis of 1832, affirming the supremacy of the federal government and denouncing the states' rights doctrine of nullification. In 1832, controversy over the national tariff brought on the most volatile moment of Jackson's presidency, when the president very nearly went to war with the state of South Carolina. In 1828, Members of South Carolina's legislature had acted on James Madison's Virginia Resolution of 30 years prior by declaring the national tariff unconstitutional. When the tariff was 